We praise Allah. We thank Him. We ask Him for forgiveness, for mercy, and for guidance. Since guided are those whom Allah will them guidance, and misguided are those whom Allah did not will them guidance. We ask Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala to raise the rank of our dearest Prophet and Master and Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to protect his nation from that which he, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, feared for it. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ and bin niyad doesn't mean that their color is brown, as according to some wannabes, scholars. He once, walayadu billah, said, the deeds are brown. He said, innamal a'malu bin niyad, he said, the deeds are brown. And that shows you the importance of knowledge, and that's the point I'm trying to make. Innamal a'malu bin niyad, meaning we have to place a sincere intention in the heart, prior to the performance of a good deed in order for one to be rewarded upon the deed on the day of judgment, inshallah ta'ala. So place a sincere intention, binniyat, meaning according to intentions. Place a sincere intention in the heart to acquire the knowledge for the sake of Allah or in obedience to Allah. And that is by saying, Repeat this sentence in your heart. I intend to acquire the knowledge in obedience to Allah Ta'ala. Today, inshallah Ta'ala, we'll be starting with the part of the book, the concise book of Abi Shuja'a. And Abi Shuja'a lived till he was over 110 years. And when he was asked about the reason as to why or what kept him so healthy looking, no back bending, in the face you can't tell that he was here this age, he said, I protected this body. Because what's the body? It's a shell and the soul is attached to it. He said, I protected it. With piety, it protected me at old age. I protected it with piety. That's how you protect your body. So at 114 years of age, when he died, he was still capable of standing upright, very healthy looking, but his time came and he died. And that was the reason why. He protected his body from sin. He protected it with piety. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala thus enabled him to enjoy this body until he was at old age. Today, inshallah, from his book, Matan Abi Shuja' or Matan al Ghaya wa Taqrib, we will be explaining about the prayers. The author, may Allah have mercy on him, said, the prayers. This unit or this chapter, I named it the unit because it says in Arabic, Kitabu Salat. When you research the word Kitab, you would find that there are many options. So I chose to call it the unit on a Salat, and that's why we said unit, the prayers. The obligatory prayers are five. The Dhuhr. And the author starts explaining about the dhuhr and its time and when it sets and so on and so forth. When the author said the prayers, we need to highlight some points about this prayer. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala said in the Quran, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ كَانَتْ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كِتَابًا مَوْقُوتًا Now, when we say the ayah, we know from the interpretation of the scholars, interpretation meaning the, the deduction of, of meaning of the ayah, 
The scholars of Islam explained and said that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala ordered us with prayers and they have times and there are other ayat in the Quran that talk about the prayer the prayers although not explicitly meaning not by saying Salat al Dhuhr, Salat al Asr, Salat al Maghrib, Salat al Aisha, Salat al Fajr, but they are mentioned. Such such is the case in the following ayah. Fasubhanallahi Hina Tumsuna wa Hina Tusbihun Walahul Hamdu Fisamawati Wal Arudi Wa Shiya wa Hina Tuzhirun. Now this ayah there's only the word Tuzhirun that we can relate to the prayer of Dhur. But the scholars of Islam said Fasubhanallahi Hina Tumsuna wa Hina Tusbihun Masa is in relation to the Night prayers, nightfall or sunset, after sunset. وَحِينَ تُصْبِحُونَ is in reference to Salat al-Subuh. وَلَهُ الْحَمْدُ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَعَشِيًّا الْعَشِي الْعَشِي is the end of day, is mid-afternoon until the end just before sunset. And that's again a point in reference to the prayer of Al-Asr. So if you look at this ayah or the next ayah, وأقم الصلاة لدلوك الشمس إلى غسق الليل وقرآن الفجر. This ayah as well talks about the times of the prayers and that there are prayers that one must pray. So all these ayat tell us that there are five prayers that one must, and that's on a daily basis. These are not the only mandatory prayers. Like the Juma is also mandatory. The Juma. But the Jumu'ah has got conditions related to it. It is Fardain, but not on women, for instance. Not on those who are traveling. Uh, not on those who are not Ahrar. So there are other issues and conditions related to it. But what is mandatory upon every accountable, male or female, traveler or resident, are these five prayers. Now that's from the Quran. Also from the Hadith, we have the saying of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which was related by Imam Ahmad. In the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, خَمْسُ صَلَوَاتٍ كَتَبَهُنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْعِبَادِ مَنْ أَتَى بِهِنَّ بِتَمَامِهِنَّ كَانَ لَهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَهْدٌ أَنْ يُدْخِلَهُ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَأْتِ بِهِنَّ فَلَيْسَ لَهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَهْدٌ أَنْ يُدْخِلَهُ الْجَنَّةِ إِنْ شَاءَ عَذَّبَهُ وَإِنْ شَاءَ أَدْخَلَهُ الْجَنَّةِ Now this hadith also says that there are five prayers and that's the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam telling us this. And can we get pleased in the habit of when we hear the name of the Prophet, all of us, to mention the salat ala al-Nabi. So every time we hear the name of the Prophet, we say, صلى الله عليه وسلم. Now in this hadith, it tells us that there are five prayers. I'm going to give you the meaning of the hadith. The Prophet said, which means five prayers are those whom Allah ordered the people to perform. Those who do perform them according to the rules of the religion will be entered paradise with the will of Allah, without prior torture. And those who do not perform them at all, they don't have that promise from Allah to be entered al-Jannah without prior torture. They might be tortured first for missing on these prayers, or they might be entered without torture. This is the meaning of the hadith. Also, another hadith that I would like to mention to you regarding the benefits of the prayers and one and why one must and why one must carefully consider the importance of these prayers and never ever think of leaving these prayers is the following hadith. 
The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked at his companions once and said, أَتَعْلَمُونَ لَوْ أَنَّ نَهْرًا بِبَابِ أَحَدِكُمْ يَغْتَسِلُ مِنْهُ كُلَّ يَوْمٍ خَمْسَ مَرَّاتٍ هَلْ يَبْقَى مِنْ دَرَنِهِ شَيْءٍ قَالُوا لَا يَبْقَى مِنْ دَرَنِهِ شَيْءٍ قَالْ فَذَلِكَ مَثَلُ الصَّلَوَاتِ الْخَمْسِ يَمْحُ اللَّهُ بِهِنَّ الْخَطَايَا Now, what's this hadith? And what does it mean? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked his companions once and said to them, how about if you had a river that flows by your house? So it goes by the house, a river. And you were to use it for washing five times a day. Would you have any dirt or filth left on you? And they said, no. He said, well, that is comparable to what the prayers are. Meaning, the small sins committed, not the great sins, and that's what the scholars of Islam explained. If an odd small sin is committed between the performance of two prayers, then the sin would be wiped off. If you pray dhuhr, for instance, and then after dhuhr, you committed a small sin, a not small sin. And this is not an encouragement to say, oh, okay, so now I've got a trick. What I'm going to do, I'm going to pray dhuhr, and I'm going to perform a thousand small sins. No one is saying that. What we're saying is, if in the event of the odd small sin happening after you pray dhuhr, for instance, when you go back to do your wudu ablution properly, and with the sunan, and also went and prayed, and got all the conditions of validity and conditions of acceptance. You met all these conditions. Inshallah ta'ala, by the will of Allah, that small sin in between these two prayers will be wiped off. This is not put in a context of encouragement for committing small sins. It is put in the context of encouraging Praying at all times. So please, let's make this very clear at the onset. So this is the matter relating to the five prayers that are obligatory upon all accountable people. So that's just to explain that the obligatory prayers are five. This was just a small summary regarding the obligation of the prayers. Now... If you notice, the scholar Abu Shuja starts by talking about the dhuhr and he moves on to its time. And he says, its time sets in, its time sets in, when the sun moves westward from the zenith, there is a point straight up at equal distance from east and west. Now, the point of timing of the prayer, and now the Imam Abi Shuja has moved into talking about when its time starts, is because in Islam, if the person wanting to pray does not know how and when the prayer times set in, then his prayer, if he doesn't follow the rules and the conditions, his prayer would not be valid. And that's why one of the scholars of the Malikiya said, وَلَا خَيْرَ فِي مَنْ كَانَ بِالْوَقْتِ جَاهِلًا وَلَمْ يَكُنْ ذَا عِلْمٍ بِمَا يَتَعَبَّدُ Meaning, this person who doesn't know when the dhuhr time starts and when it finishes, how can he pray dhuhr? You see, a lot of people nowadays go by listening to a radio station outside the 2M FM, which is very thorough in putting the times for the prayers. But if we go back to our homelands, there are many radio stations that are programmed automatically to start the event at a certain time. This is not a valid way to deem 
a certain time for the prayer as serin. You can't count on radio stations to just think that the time is in, or TVs. You can't. The way it is done is by way of ijtihad, and I'll explain what is ijtihad. And the other way of deeming the time is in is by having a person who is a trustworthy Muslim. And trustworthiness in Islam has got conditions. Telling you that the time has set in. Outside these two methods, one is not to deem a prayer or a time of a prayer as in before he does one of those two things. Now, the ishtihad is research. What is research? Is by going out, looking at the sun, seeing that it moved in a westward direction, so it's going in a westerly direction, away from the center, the pinnacle, the summit, the apex, the peak, point in the sky. If you look up in the sky and you look at the sun, you will see that it's moving at an equal distance from the point where you're in, east, and then it goes west. It's like a radius. It's as if you're in the center of a circle and the sun is moving from east to west. Now, it could be going in front of you, but the distance is still the same. The highest point the sun reaches is what we call the zenith, the apex, the the point that is um, above you, very high up in the sky when you see the sun. When the sun is there, and we'll explain how the Dhuhr time happens in a minute, but when the sun is there, and you're looking at it, and you see that fraction of a motion. The sun has moved westerly. Then you deem Dhuhr time as in. So, if you do this, then you would have researched and investigated the prayer time setting in. If you don't investigate, there is no ishtihad on your part. You didn't go and seek the happening, the occurrence of the time setting in, then it's not good enough for you to go and pray. Does this mean if my little daughter, who, was, who is five years old, comes and tells me, Baba, I think time of Dhuhr is in. I can't pray. No, you cannot pray. You have to research and investigate. What about a watch? What about if I got a watch? Many people, what they do, even if they have a watch, they check the calendar that is written by trustworthy people. After they check the calendar, they go and check few watches, and they also go out and check to see if the time has set in. Once they are sure that they've done enough investigation, that the heart is rest, resting in the sense that it has no doubt anymore regarding whether or not the time has set in, that's when they can pray. What about if a trustworthy Muslim, meaning a person who doesn't commit great sins and doesn't insist on committing small sins, learned about the matters of the religion and doesn't do silly stuff or stuff that are not attributed to the likes of him? And one day we'll explain at length what the trustworthy person is. But if this trustworthy Muslim comes to you and you ask him and you say, did Duhur time set in? And he says to you, yes, it did. You can use his saying to deem the time of the prayer as in. If you don't do that and you don't do the previous method that I told you about personal investigation and you just simply go and pray Duhur because it feels like Duhur, your prayer is not valid. Your prayer is not right. And that's one of the conditions of validity. Shani validity, yani if the prayer is valid to start with. We're not talking about the conditions of acceptance, where the prayer is rewardable or not. We are talking about 
the me validity. Simply whether the prayer is valid or not valid. This matter, the times of the prayer, if it's not well investigated, it renders, it renders the prayer invalid. So we need to watch for this and we need to be careful about when we go to pray, making sure that the time has set in. Now we will start, inshallah ta'ala, by explaining how the dhuhr time starts. The dhuhr, its time sets in when the sun moves westward from the zenith. Now we explained what the zenith is. Very good. If the person has checked it, like two days before, or three days, or whatever the case might be, and he is well aware of how to check the times, and he is sure by 12.30 is way past, and well past, the definite time for the to have set in, then it's good enough. But what you do is, because watches sometimes can be deceiving, what you do is you don't check one watch, and I asked personally about this a long time ago, you check many watches just to make sure, just in case yours is running a little bit fast or whatever. But that's good enough, because what you've done is, you've made sure that it enters at around 12.15, um, and you are sure of that, You've checked it a few days before, and you know according to the calendar that we have, or you have, it's about 12.20 now, and you can relate to the previous days when you checked it, so it's definitely around that time. And then you check the time on a few watches, and you make sure that it was 10 minutes or 15 minutes uh, in time. Then that's good enough. You can do that. That's fine. But I would give you a, uh, a word of advice. Every now and then, because people sometimes build that habit and keep going, Every now and then, and I've seen this happen by some scholars of Islam. Um, I've seen many of them. They would go out to the veranda at around noon time, and he would check and look and, and make sure that it's in. Although he knows the time, he knows it's set in, just in case he wants to reaffirm and reconfirm. So never use it as a general rule all the time without going and checking. Make it a habit. Make it a habit. And remember that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam praised those ones who do use the sun and the moon and the stars for checking the times of the prayers. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna khiyara ibadillah alladheena yura'oona al-shamsa wal-qamara wal-adhillata li dhikrillah. And in one of the hadith, wal-nujum. There's the addition of the nujum. So these people are praised for investigating, observing, watching, and then judging and deeming the time as in for any given prayer. So that's very important. Now, when the sun moves from its apex, from the zenith, from the central point, the upper central point in the sky, above you, above your head, in a westerly direction, it starts to move. That fraction of the motion indicates a time of Dhuhr as Serin. When it's exactly in the middle, this time is called time of Zawal. And when it's time of Zawal, this sun being on top of any object on a leveled surface, it will have a certain shadow, but not in all countries and not in all days. Take, for instance, in Mecca. In Mecca, there is a day in the year, and according to some, it's 17th of June. If you have an object that is present on a level surface, that object would not have a shadow. Some other days, it will have a little shadow. So what will happen is this, and I will finish my lesson with this point today because next time when we meet, we need to have understood how this thing works so that we can relate to it how the mid-afternoon prayer, the Asr prayer sets in as well. And other times like chosen times and preferred times and they're all written in your book. But please do not endeavor in trying and understand something if it's not clear enough because we acquire knowledge by learning and not by reading. When the sun is at its zenith, there will be a certain shadow given. And we want to use our common sense a little bit here and some calculations. Okay, This is the level surface and this is the object. When the sun is 
in the east, early in the morning, what do we expect the shadow to be like? Short or long? Long. And in what direction? Westerly. Very good. When the sun is toward the west, very much in the west, just before it sets in, where is the shadow? East. Is it long or short? Long. So if it's long here and it's long there, when the sun is at extremes, east and west, it is safe to assume that when it's in the middle of the sky, it's going to be at its longest or shortest? Shortest. Okay. When it was at its east and it's moving upward, what's happening to that shadow? Is it increasing or decreasing? Decreasing. decreasing. So again, it is safe to assume now that the more the sun goes up, the shadow will become shorter, 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 and then it's going to change direction, right? So it's going to become shorter, change direction. When the sun moves westerly, it's going to now take an easterly direction, the shadow, and grow up again. So there will be a point when the shadow is at its smallest size, and that's when the sun is where? Zenith time. We can call it also the summit, or the peak, or the highest central point, or whatever other terminology. Yes, also Sheikh Salim tells us that when the sun is in the middle, the shadow will either be north or south. And how do we know this? Because if it is shortest and it's starting to move, it's not going to be easterly, because if it's easterly, the sun is still westerly. And if it's westerly, the sun, the shadow will be easterly. So it makes sense also to know that the shadow will be either to the south or to the north. North in Lebanon, the shadow will be, and south in Australia, the shadow will be. So when it's shortening, and it's early morning, and the shadow is in the, in the west, it shortens, 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 and then turns to the south. That's at its shortest length. We're talking about the shadow. And then it moves to the easterly direction and starts to grow again with the sun moving westerly. With this today, we end our lesson. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمْ عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَتَقَبَّلِ اللَّهُمَّ مِنَّا عَمَلَنَا هَذَا بِسِرِّ سُورَةِ الْفَاتِحَةِ بَعْدَ التَّهْلِيلِ ثَلَاثًا وَالصَّلَاةِ عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ